we do a mic check, please? Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ducks Limit Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jennings. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Brazier. My name is John Gordon. I'll be your host. And I'm your host, Katie Burke. Welcome to the Ducks Unlimited Podcast, the only podcast about all things waterfowl. From hunting insights to science-based discussions about ducks, geese, and issues affecting waterfowl and wetlands conservation in North America. The DU Podcast, sponsored by Purina Pro Plan, the official performance dog food of Ducks Unlimited. Purina Pro Plan, always advancing. everybody. Welcome back to the Ducks Unlimited podcast. This is your host, Katie Burke. And on the show today, I have a very special guest, Mark Warmoth. He is a Tennessee call collector, outdoorsman, enthusiast, all things. Yeah. Yeah. That describes it pretty good, I think. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Mark. Well, thank you. Um, so we are at, uh, and I just had another interview, so I'm not sure what uh, order these will come in, but we were at the Callapalooza in Stuttgart. This is my first visit to Callapalooza. I think this is my fourth. I think it's. Fourth? I think they've been doing it five years. And okay. somebody informed me that I missed the first year. Okay, <laughs> like, you know, I'm like okay. <laughs> so how has it changed in four years? It has grown uh, dramatically and for the better, and it's it's a great time. This is one I don't want to miss. Yeah, it's yeah. changed times of year, right? Or is it always been? He he has adjusted it just slightly mm-hmm. here, this way, and that. Okay. And, you know, so far it's worked out with my hunting schedule, and, yeah. and I'm able to come play. So yeah, that's awesome. Or, you know, reunion with my friends and stuff like that. So yeah, did you bring calls to collect or I, trade? Or Ryan Graves and I are in charge of the vintage call contest every year. Okay. So we kind of come and help and do that, and then we bring calls to put in it and try to entice other people into bringing their calls and displaying and just teaching people and answering questions about old duck calls. Oh, that's cool. So are there different categories and then how many entries? Through the years, we've done different things. Like this year, we're doing um, states, plain calls, no no checkering, no carving or anything like that. And we're just doing individual states. Who's got the best smooth call? Oh, cool. Yeah. So, you know, we're doing Tennessee, Illinois, Louisiana, um, Arkansas, and maybe Missouri. Um, okay. You know, so people will bring in their calls and we'll display them out there and then we'll let the folks vote as to which is their So it'll be like a, a public vote. Yeah, it'll be a public vote. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So we've done it in the past with checkered calls and carved calls and unknown, best unknown calls. And there's been some great calls show up here. Yeah. You know, anything and, exciting that you hadn't seen before? Uh, Tom Roseberry showed up here this week. So that's a pretty special call. Yeah. That's an Illinois call. Very, very nice call. And in the past, you know, we've had Ira Ferguson, which is probably my favorite of all calls. They come from unexpected places? Really, they do. A lot of times locals will show up and say, hey, this was my granddad's call. And, you know, it's been in a box and I just found it. And we're like, John, Ryan, and I are going, oh, my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) That is exciting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, You know, that doesn't happen with decoys like it used to, but calls, it's still, they're they're, still out there. They're still coming out of the closet. And and that's the neat thing about it. You think you've seen it all, and then somebody shows up with something really special, and we're all like, oh, my gosh. Do Do they even know what they have? A lot of times they don't. A lot of times they don't know anything about it. And, you know, I picked up a, which is one of my holy grails and duck calls, a really nice checkered Tom Turpin call. Yeah. And I was at duck camp. And typically when somebody says, oh, my grandma's got some calls. And, you, you know, you think, well, okay. And, you know, I explained to him, I said, hey, you know, give me a picture of it. I said, ten, nine times out of 10, it's, you know, it's going to be something that's production. And this fellow told me, he said, hey, um, I've got this. You know, my mom's mom's got this call. Let me get a picture of it. He sent it, and he opened up the phone. I looked at it. I went, oh, my goodness. I mean, this is a $10,000 duck call. Yeah, that's amazing. It was amazing. a checker Tom Turpin from Memphis, Tennessee, and I was like, oh, wow. I had my, my jaw hit the floor. <laughs> you hit the floor. Yeah, you're shot. <laughs> yeah, I was like, and I, and I told him, I said, I just bought one of these. I bought one of these two or three weeks ago. And uh, he was 
He couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Did he sell it? Yes, he did. (laughs) Do you have it? I do have it. It'll be at my house for a long time. (laughs) That's amazing. I love stories like that. And I feel like we hear them more in calls than we do in decoys. Like, they mean, you you have old stories of decoys, but... It's neat that this stuff keeps popping up. It's nice that y'all have, like, this... that John has put this on and it is. we get to have a little more opportunity for it. You yeah, know, there's lo- not a lot of opportunity for these things. Yeah. And he's been changing in and out the displays in there. You know, I, Ryan had his in here first, I think. And okay. I've had mine. Mike Lewis has had his here. And it's kind of like uh, in Memphis, what, yeah. what DU is doing, you know, f- switching out collections. And, and that's so cool to come see. It's a nice thing. Like, I get asked that a lot. Like, you know, if I want like more of a permanent thing and, I prefer to be able to showcase all the collectors and what they got doing. Because, I mean, a lot of the people coming through don't have any, they don't know what this stuff is. Right. And, you know, it, I, and I like that. But I'd also like to see a place where calls can live. Yeah. Where, you know, instead of my calls sitting in my living room and me being the only one that looks at them, take them down right. somewhere that, that everybody can enjoy them and learn about them. And- oh, yeah. I mean, I guess the dream would be like... Have a museum with all the, you know, a permanent collection of great calls and then like a residency where you could teach people to make them, to blow them, like, you know, right. full the full gamut of the art of calling. And that'd be, I mean, that's the dream, but. Yeah, that's kind of my, you're, you're kind of doing what my dream is. <laughs> yeah, we get, we just need a funder. How are we going to yeah. find this this money, Mark? I keep thinking about that. I've got ideas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you let me know and I'll help you out. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that would be amazing. I know I've talked to, I actually just, on the opposite for decoys, I was talking, I just interviewed Jerry Talton in North Carolina, and he has this dream of a retreat where he would house decoy carvers and a, in the core sound area and teach them to, like the tradition of carving a core sound decoy. And he would come, like carvers could come in and stay for a week, a month, however long, I could have a whole place to stay. Oh, that'd be nice. Oh, I know. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm now I'm repeating right, his dream, so he has to make it happen because right. I've said it too many times. I'm thinking right down that lines with on the duck call side. Yeah. I mean, think about, you know, a display museum in oh, the yeah. prairie. All right. Overlooking a duck marsh that you can take clients out and or friends out and yeah. go duck hunting and they come can. play calls all night. Yeah. And then go out there and use them to hunt with and see if, see if they actually bring a duck in. <laughs> Can you call a duck? <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool. All right. Well, we went off on a tangent, so let's. Oh, sorry. Let's, oh, we're gonna do that a lot. So okay. just just to be aware, it's it's always tangents are good things. So I like them. So we'll probably do that a few times. But let's get back and kind of introduce the audience to you and how you got into hunting and kind of your background in the outdoors and what well, that like. I attribute it all to my dad. Okay. You know, my, he started me when I was young. He was a hunter. I'm, you know, I was thinking about it earlier today. How did I start? And I can remember, you know, you start with a BB gun out in the backyard at grandmama's house or great grandma's house, yeah. whatever. But he was a quail hunter in Kentucky and a rabbit hunter and a, a squirrel hunter. And I remember walking with him quail hunting, but I wasn't hunting then. Yeah. And then, and then we went into to squirrel hunting, and then I got a twenty two and got to shoot a few squirrels, and then, then we kind of got away from hunting in life and growing up and work and all that. And his best friend was from South Dakota, huh. and he went one Thanksgiving and left me at home when I was, you know, preteens, I guess. And he went up and pheasant hunted with Colonel Bacon, my dad's best friend in South Dakota. And when he got home, he said. I'll never do that again. I said, well, you'll never do what? He said, I'll never leave you at home from that again. <laughs> and he took me, and that's where I started was pheasant hunting in South Dakota. That's a pretty a good start. Oh, there. it was yeah. wonderful. And and then, you know, while I was there, you know, we'd be hunting on the, the Missouri River, you know, edge of the Missouri River up on the corn flats, and these geese would come off the Missouri River and come up and just thousands and thousands. I said, Dad, I want to try that. Yeah, and he was like, "Okay." So a couple of years later, when we went back out, I got into goose hunting. That was my first experience with waterfowl. Wow, yeah, that's different. So I mean, I've been doing it 
my whole life. I fell into turkey hunting. And, well, you live in West Tennessee, correct? Uh, well, Central, Central North yeah. Central turkey, Tennessee. Turkey, yeah, dominant yeah. area. Yeah, Right, but we, we've got good duck hunting yeah. there, too. So so we, we got into the duck hunting thing. You know, I've been doing that, I don't know how many years. I've got it written down, but like 40 years. And uh, this is my 35th year turkey hunt. So I've been doing it all the way. And, I, you know, for a while, and I chase them pretty hard. I've got a, I've got a wife that understands it, and, you know, <laughs> so she lets me get away with uh-huh. a lot of things. I'm very blessed with my home and family. and That's awesome. Yeah, those turkeys, they're maddening. My, the audience very much knows my anger at the turkeys. And so they, they've <laughs> oh, heard really? it a few times. But yeah, they're they're Well, I'm, I'm trying to eradicate them for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll help you. Out. Okay. Over, I'll help you in Mississippi area. <laughs> but so you, so when do you start, do you were hunt with your father waterfowling in Tennessee as he well? Or did he you? never really waterfowl hunted. Yeah. And a, a friend of mine at church took me duck hunting for the first time okay. and got me just uh, the day one I was hooked. Yeah, and were been, you doing private or public? I mean, it was public land. Public it was, land. yeah, it was. You know, uh, TWRA has uh, wildlife management areas in Tennessee, which I'm sure you're aware of. Yep. And so we hunt. Typically, I grew up hunting on in Dover bottoms. Okay. But you know, I've migrated to California and Canada and Colorado and wherever my wife will let me get away with. So where's them. your favorite place? I like it all. You like it yeah, all? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, there's such special, you, you take it all in, and I take it all in no matter where I go. Yeah. Southern Missouri or, or I can't say that I've hunted Illinois, even though that's a, that's a strong, stronghold for waterfowling, but, so I just collect duck calls from there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and, and, and duck calls, are an extension of duck hunting to me. Okay. And that lets me chase ducks all year long. 365, I'm playing duck calls or turkey hunting or duck hunting. Yeah, do you do turkey calls as well? Uh, by default, you know, yeah. if okay. you're a turkey you hunter, a good one there, you're, so. if you're a turkey hunter, you end up with calls, you know, you'll buy a new one. And before long, you look in the corner and you're going, uh, oops, we oops. got too many. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's interesting. Um, so when do you, Start getting interested in the older and the old calls. I guess I've had the uh, collecting mentality ever since I was little. You know, start out with mm-hmm. matchboxes and then stamps and matchbooks and yeah. you know all that kind of stuff. And it, it just—I remember going to Real Foot Lake with my dad. They used to go down. His family, four generations of us, would go to Real Foot Lake fishing for brim. Yeah, and. uh we would eat at a famous restaurant called Boyette's. You've probably been, been there. I haven't been there, but I know of it. Well, Red Boyette was a duck call maker. And actually, I've got one that I entered in the show here. That oh, day. wow. But uh, we would go to the restaurant and have, have fish. And, they, you know, how they'd have displays of calls down in the bottom and sell them to the, to the hunter and fishermen that come in. And so I saw one. And it's like, you know, little kids are, Daddy, buy me one. Daddy, buy me yeah. one. And that's where my first call came from. And, oh, really? Yeah. That's and really so finally, after three or four years, he's like, to shut me up here. Give me one of those duck calls. So you know? what was it? It was Earl Dennison. An Earl Dennison yeah. was your first. Do you still have it? Oh yeah, yeah. I wouldn't get rid yeah. of it. Yeah, that was your first call. When was that? How old? Were oh you? my gosh, um, I don't even know. It was, it was a lot. It was before I started duck hunting. Okay. It was before I started hunting. Yeah, you know, we would so go you were in. Really young. We were really young, and we would go in there, and every year they were there, and I was like, mm, Dad. Did you blow it? Did you? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. I mean, I've got teeth marks on it. You know? Yeah, I was like, you probably didn't treat it very well at that age. No, and you look at it now, and it, it, I mean, it's special because it was the first, it's what started this whole addiction, I guess. Yeah. So, you know, and the love for history of it. How long, when did you realize what you had had? When did it come, like, aware that you had an Earl Dennison and who Earl Dennison oh, was? Oh, I had no idea about it. It yeah. was just a duck call from Real Foot Lake. And, yeah. And then, until I got into duck hunting, and it was probably three or four years, that, you know, Real Foot Lake has the CCAA call collectors yes. show. And I missed that the first few years, and, and my buddies from home were like, hey, you need to go to this. This is, and man, when I went, you know, the first year, I didn't have a lot of money, and I bought. You know, I thought $100 was a lot, and I bought three $40 duck calls. I know the math doesn't work, but, <laughs> you know, so right. I kept it small. And the next year, it was like I had a little extra, and I 
it was 10 duck calls. Before long, it was like 40 duck calls. You know, <laughs> just going, just spending everything you got. Yeah. Save up and then go buy them. Were you just buying anything and I everything? bought anything. You know, to me, there's no better use of a stick of wood than to turn it into a duck call. And I don't care where it's from. Yeah. You know, if I could, I'd own one of every one of them. Or I'd own them all and then everybody could just come look at them. So it's been, you know, it's been a while. And that, that's how I got started. And then and then these different shows have started popping up and going to those shows. Mm-hmm. The internet and, you know, talking to people that, that are friends of mine who are guides or old old duck hunters. And, you know, a lot of time they, they call them leads. You get a lead on somebody and you go talk to them about it. Well, no, they're not ready to, to sell their calls. And, well, someday if you do, yeah, I'm interested in, you know, I'll put them on the shelf and build a call collection. So I started with, with all states, all calls, and then I realized I really couldn't afford to do that. And people had told me before they would concentrate on a state. Yeah. You know, okay, well, you're from Tennessee. Why don't you just collect Tennessee calls? And at one point, I had probably over 100 different Arkansas makers. And I thought, well, I could take that money and put it into Tennessee. So I've kind of weeded out, not that I don't love them, but I've weeded out other states to make my Tennessee collection grow. Yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah. so that's kind of, and, and as a call collector, buy what you want. I buy what I want. I evolve. You know, I'm over here looking at Joe Bu- Buker's carve calls. They're unbelievable. Right. Yeah. And he's not Tennessee, but I mean, I'm addicted to great stuff. And yeah. I'm like, okay, I want that one, that one, that one, that one. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the real, when did the real foot show start? Oh my goodness. We've been going for 25 or 30 years. So now. is it the oldest call show? Yes. Well, it's call specific, I guess. Yep, yeah. Yep. Yep. So yeah. How has that changed? It was really organized at the beginning. Yeah. You know, they would shut down the town. The town would support it. You know, they put tents up all the way downtown and vendors would come just like they're doing here at John's and set up down the street. It, it has gotten away from that. It's kind of separated to two parts of the little town. And, you know, all the all the contemporary guys are down at the boat dock and staying in cabins down there. And, and we've tried to integrate the old with the new. Right. And the old guys are up front, you know, collecting. And so it 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 has gotten smaller. Okay. But you know, I say it's gotten smaller. It's just changed. It's evolved in something totally different. Yeah. Because the organizer organizers they're not doing as much anymore. Yeah. Is it I mean and is it also like an age is like aging situation as well? It is. And Brian and By- Brian Byers and Ryan and several of us have tried to do events there to pull everybody together. Like yeah. call identification, you know, and we've right. done that here. Yeah. You know, we'll put a bunch of calls out. We'll put a case of calls out with 20 calls in it and we'll give a prize to the guy that can name most of the calls. And that, you know, that oh, teaches. that's fun. Yeah, yeah. That teaches new guys about how, you know, what you have. Yeah. That's really cool. I never thought of that. That's a that's a good idea. Yeah. That's well, and, you know, and we had some we had some guys that you wouldn't have expected it, but they got them all. And, oh, I mean, that's really cool. And yeah. you, know, you know, and you know, people walk by, and go, well, I don't know what any of that is. Like, guess, and then come back yeah. and look, see how many you got right. Right. Yeah. So we'll give you a list of names, and then you can just I'd be match them to the calls. If I got too many wrong, well, we you know we found we found that happen. Yeah. You know, oh, I don't want to do that because I don't want to look dumb. No. <laughs> It's it's about educating people. Yeah. Know? I found this job in a lot of ways. Like, it's I've, I've talked about this a thousand times, and the audience is probably sick of hearing me talk about it, but I grew up in Mississippi Delta. We right. just don't have a historical... We have a historical hunting tradition, but we don't have calls to pull on or decoys to pull on. We just... Right. So that was kind of void of my childhood. I didn't I didn't know about it. The only thing I knew is my dad blew an old and he was the only person who ever blew an old. He still blows one, a D2 old. And that's the only thing I knew is he, my dad blew this weird black call that I can't get to make a sound because it's given you so much air. Yeah. So when I came in, I you know, I, I got, you know, a history degree or history degree, and I went to museums and then I got this job and I knew a lot about Ducks Unlimited's history, but this was so new to me. And one of the things that I have found difficult with my position is instead of like, I guess, not to call someone out, but like, you know, if certain like the Core Sound Museum or something like that, they are just focusing on the Core Sound area decoys. Right. But with Ducks Unlimited, I have to focus on 
everything. <laughs> right. And because I have to focus on everything, I keep just getting a cursory knowledge, a surface level knowledge of things. It's hard to really learn it because I keep having to like learn just the the surface level of everything. And I almost wish I was like at like a more specific area that I could just yeah, you know, get the meat out of it. I think that comes with time, though. Yeah. Because as I was listening to you, y'all talk last night, I was like, wow, she knows about that. She knows about this. I'm, I, I was impressed. <laughs> oh, God, that makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I was like... Because that's my insecurity uh, that's, with all of this, is that I, I don't get to dive into things the way I would like to. And it's... Well, yeah. I, it just takes time. Yeah. And it's like, you know, people, how do you know... How do you know this about these duck calls? Well, it's because I fool with them all the time. Yeah. And, you know, I've got a passion for it. Right. And so do these decoy guys. They've got a passion for what they do. And, you know, I've got a friend uh, in California that, that delves into all of it. And he knows more about all of it than I know about one little piece. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. So yeah. it just comes with time. It's true. I mean, it, what it reminds me of is like my husband who's from Massachusetts, but he gets tickled when we drive through the Delta and he'll be like, what crop is that, Katie? And I'm like, I'll tell him. And yeah. he's like, how do you know? I'm like, I don't know. I just, just know. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, people with trees. Just and, osmosis. Yeah. yeah. It's like people that can tell you, just look at the bark of a tree and say, oh, this, this. And I'm yeah. like, I'm envious of that. Yeah. I, I do get envious of that too. I can only be like, I know it's an oak tree. I have no idea what kind. <laughs> yeah, it's it does kind of like soak in and you don't even realize you're learning things. Well, it's soaking in because I listened to you and I was like, I was impressed. You know, when you spend all your days looking at calls and looking at decoys, you do eventually. And honestly, this, doing this podcast, talking to y'all, listening to your stories, I, I get to learn so much through it. And it's, it's so nice. I love it. Yeah, it's a great, I can't. Yeah, I'm jealous. I uh, think what I, you're doing is really yeah, it's cool. It's really nice. Since we went off on another tangent, let's take a quick break <laughs> and then we'll come right back in and get a little more into it. Stay tuned to the Ducks Unlimited podcast, sponsored by Purina Pro Plan, after these messages. Let's kind of go back in and you're. You mentioned a little bit about the Call Collectors Association, and I know you've been active and all that. So two questions, I guess. Let's go with when you start collecting and you meet other collectors, it's pretty common with other collectors that they meet another collector that is influential in what they're doing and that sort of thing. Is that similar in your story? Did you kind of meet other collectors that you you know were able to learn from and kind of shape what you were doing? Yeah, Um I feel like I was very fortunate because I was a whole lot younger than the guys that were really seriously collecting. Yeah. You know, some of those guys took me under their wing and taught me and showed me. I was very fortunate to get to see a lot of the major collections around the country, you know, because we shared the interests of hunting and collecting and in waterfowl hunting or, or different aspects. And, you know, Ross DeStefano has been a big influence to me. Okay. And he's a great collector. You know, I got to see Howard Harlan's stuff yeah. early on. He's just really close to you. Yeah. yeah. And and so I've I've been blessed to to have the doors open to to many of these different things. And and our age gap was, you know, it's twenty years or better. Yeah. And, you know, here I'm this kid that's got a, not got any money. Yeah. You know, and I can only buy one or two calls at a time, but you know, people took that in, took me in and Yeah. You know, so with that, because you're so much younger and you're going these things, did they take you seriously at first or how did that go? I that's a good that's a good point. I had there's a famous guide on Real Foot Lake, John Cochran. Yep. You know, are you familiar yes, with the Cochran family? Very familiar. Wow, good. <laughs> well, I used to I used to hunt with family, and he's got two sons, Joe and Johnny. Uh, Joe's still living, but I would I would hunt the opening. You know, Tennessee had an open split, so I'd go to Real Foot to get two opening days. Okay, because they they would open, then they would shut down, and then they would reopen. Right. So uh, I took advantage of that to have two opening day hunts while well, I hunted with the Cochrans. Oh, wow. And so, you know, when I would go hunt with them, you know, I put a group together and take them up there every year. And I was young doing this. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, this was right out of high school. So 
Johnny Cochran or John Cochran was the call maker. Yep. And I'd go to the house and I'd buy a call every time I went. And so I went in one day and he he had a, a cabinet of calls and he had this really neat old unknown call sitting on the cap, cabinet shelf. And I looked at it and I said, Mr. Cochran, what about that call right there? I'd, I'd be interested in buying. Is it for sale? He goes, son, that's a collector's call. And I said, well, I'd like to have it. <laughs> and that was my first unknown antique duck call that yeah. I bought. And so it's what you said kind of that's crazy. Kind of gives the story back to that. Yeah. So, I don't know. If what was that like hunting with the Cochrane? It was wild. Yeah. It was. It was. Um, it was neat to hunt on the historic firing line, and Johnny and Joe feuded a lot. These are two brothers. Yeah, yeah. Shooting ducks off of each other, you know. And well, fighting real each foot other. has a lot of rivalry history. It's yes, not a. Yes, it does. It's a lot of tension in that area. Yeah, but I, I, I did never hunt with Mister Cochran because he had, he had kind of quit by the time okay. I started. So, so I'd hunt with Joe, and then, you know, Joe Joe probably stayed at it the longest. It did was, they have it their was own great. blinds? Like, did they have, yeah. Yeah, they were on the refuge border, and they sat within 200 yards of each other. And shooting each other out. Shooting at each other, <laughs> cussing each other, oh, fighting gosh. with each other. It, I mean, it was, a, it was a treat. Watching a duck work their blind and shooting just to yeah, make it. Yeah, and a lot of times those old guides on the lake the night before would go out and get blasted. Oh, yeah. So, you know, they'd bring us to the blind, drop us off, and we'd do our own thing, and he'd yeah. go back and rest for a while. Yeah, so when did, when did, so at that point, you could hunt, you didn't have to, like, draw for blinds or anything like that yeah, at that those, point. So when did that, I don't even know when that started. Oh, those were, um, they're changing that now, which, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's all, yeah, it's all very They called them grand, yeah, they called them grandfathered, uh, so grandfather are, blinds. Yeah, those are grandfather blinds. Yeah, okay. and, and, they, you know, somebody started saying, well, hey, this isn't fair. It's on public ground. So so they came up with a plan that you, if you didn't register blind, it went back into the public draw. Okay. Or, you know, if you passed away and hadn't signed your blind off to one of your children. Okay. So at some point in the future, all those blinds will become public draw right. blinds. Yeah. So what happened to the Cochrane blinds? The, um, Are they public now? Because that's really cool that you can be in. Yeah, Mark Pierce still has one of them. I don't think he had his own blind, and he's one of the grandchildren. Uh, Johnny Cochran, he's a call maker. Yep. Um, the young Johnny Cochran. Yeah, young Johnny. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he maintained if he he kept his father's blind or not, but I think one of them has gone back to the state, and I'm not sure about the other one. That's really cool. Yeah, I wouldn't even think about them still hunting and being yeah. out there at that time and making calls. But there's so many, so many call makers that came from Real Foot. Yeah. You know, you got, you know, Nashville great, Johnny Marsh, you know, his blind's still famous out on the lake, the Cochran's, you know, it's just rich history of waterfowling oh, yeah. and duck calls. Yeah, we're working on, I mean, this is separate in the conversation, but we're working on uh, Discovery Park of America. Yep. We're helping them with a big waterfowl exhibit that's going to be permanent. And it's going to be really cool. Yeah, it's going to be really nice. It's it's geared at a younger age group because right. um, that's their museum. Is But it's like a, an education thing. They're going to build a real foot blind and you'll be able to go in a real foot blind and yeah, it'll be pretty neat. It's interesting and I don't know what your thoughts about this, but like when we built the museum, I've said this before, but, you know, Johnny Morris was like, here's the space. I want you to build a, a, water, a Ducks Limited History Waterfowling Museum. And we had never really thought about our history in that way. Like, oh, people would be interested and we didn't collect our own history, you know. And then um, I just, since I've had this job between us, Discovery Park, Peoria Museum in Illinois. There's still a few that were doing it elsewhere, but um, at one point there was talk of something going that was going to happen in California. This acknowledgement of waterfowling as a significant part of American history has been really interesting. It's really like blown up. And yeah. I don't know what your thoughts about that, but it's I think it's amazing. No, I, think I think it's think really it, cool. I think it's wonderful. And in you know, Johnny John L. Morris, he played a big part in that. And like on the duck call sides, he's one of the first people, you know, the the, the Bass Pro Shop in Louisiana. I'm not sure which 
place it is. Yeah, but not either. they bought the, the Darren Fontenot collection out. Oh, are you familiar? I'm with not familiar. With so, this. so Darren Fontenot was a young fellow. He's about my age, and he collected Louisiana duck calls, and he put together and wrote the Louisiana duck call book. Okay, yeah, I know. And the, I know, yeah, I know he, that. he, you know, once he got done with it and did everything he was going to do, you know, at that time, Bass Pro was going around buying decoys up and stuff to decorate their shops, and uh, they bought Darren Fontenot's collection, and it's on display. Maybe in Shreveport. Okay. Yeah, I mean that's a really there's yeah, a really a nice, nice collection down there, and yeah. that kind of started the purchasing of duck call collections. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, it's been it's been really interesting how it's just like, and it is. It's a very I don't think people realize like the art of call making and decoys. It is American specific. It's not. Yeah. It's a very. It's our culture. It's our folk art. There's. It's really not a lot of tradition that, especially, it's definitely call making. There's not. It doesn't extend past us. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Not at all. It's very interesting, and I like that it's kind of getting its recognition. You know, I mean, the like the major museums in New York are putting decoys on display. That's cool. It's so cool. Yeah, it's yeah. really neat. Like we're being, they're being credited as artists, which I find to be funny. Like these guys out here would not call themselves artists like that are out here like selling calls right. that they have, especially the guy you mentioned earlier that you want to buy a call from. Like that is art. Oh, it is. But he won't even probably refer to himself in that way. Yeah. He's pretty humble, but he's, man, that guy's talented. Oh, yeah. it's. In, I don't know why, what it is about carvers, but they are, they they, they don't like the word artist. <laughs> oh, <they're>, yeah. <laughs> so, anyway. So, yeah, you told me about kind of, as in that, the, how they got in, and if they were serious, and you know, if you had any inspiration. But what was it like? When did you start getting involved in the Call Collectors Association? And and let's kind of go into that. And like, I want to talk about yeah, the competition in with NWTF and right. how you got involved in all of that part of it as well, because that's a whole different. I don't think I'm pretty sure I had. We've maybe had cursory mentions of like the. The carving, comp- like the NWTF competition. Right. I don't think we've really talked about it on the podcast. So I'd like you to kind of okay. walk us through what that's like. Sure. My wife and I, when we were young, we just, the national convention was held in Nashville. We started a local chapter, me and some friends in, in our town. And the chapter paid for she and I to go check the convention out. Oh. And that, that was our first. And we've not missed one since. And that was like 30 years ago. Been to, been all over the country doing this, and you know I'm a turkey hunter, but I'm a waterfowler too. Yeah. And if they happened at the same time, I don't know what I do. <laughs> and somebody asked me the other day, which one would you give up if you have to give up? And I just didn't answer him because I wouldn't. <laughs> it's like choosing a favorite child. Yeah, <laughs> just can't do it. <laughs> no, but uh, so so that's how I got to go into the NWTF. Well, the first the first banquet. I walked in, uh, you know, they had a silent auction set up. I thought, well, this is cool. And I'm walking down the aisle, and there is a Kent Freeman carved and painted duck call. And he's a, he's a carver out of Missouri. He's world famous. He's he's won all kinds of decoy carving contests. And I mean, this is just, it blew my mind to walk in a place like this, see a duck call. And I'm like, that's cool. Yeah. I'm bidding on it. Well, I got to bid against this guy. And you mentioned Olt mm-hmm. the other day. Well, it was Olt's grandson, Skylar Olt. And he and I were bidding against this call. And I said, man, I'm not going to stop. <laughs> he goes, he wrote a number, a number down, and I wrote another number down. And he goes, all right, I quit. And I ended up, you know, I got my first car, fancy duck call. Okay. Tell the difference. I don't even know if our listeners would know the difference between like a fancy duck call and like a... Just a working duck call. Yeah. A working duck call would be just like like old, you said, or, you know, what these guys out here are making. Yeah. And they've evolved over time because, you know, people get a plain old wallet to call and duck hunt with it. A fancy call would be something that was painted or checkered or carved. Okay. You know, uh, backing up to old times, Glodo was given the name of the, being the guy that made the fancy first fancy duck call, Checkery. So Glodo making these these checkered duck calls, that's where the fancy came into it. He added a little more because Yeah, why? Why would he do that? Because they would sell better. Okay. That's just simply that. Why was Glodo adding like so you say he made the first fancy call, so why would he add the checkering? You know, I I don't really know the answer to that, but I, my assumption would be to to put a different flair on what other people are doing. 
Just for marketing. Cathartic. Marketing, yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, nowadays, you it used to be a plain old walnut call without a band. Then they added bands to fancy them up a little bit. And now they're doing all these exotic woods and, you know, dyed woods and different. Yeah, the dyed woods yeah, are really interesting. Yeah. had different shapes. And so, you know, a fancy call is something that's, that's adorned. And, and, you know, a plain hunting call is just a plain hunting call. Okay. So, okay, let's go back to... You mentioned like with an NWTF, like, so how does that eventually become the So how that became a competition back then at the convention, they had all these different uh, competitions just to bring something different to the, to the show. They did, you know, kids art contests. They did sculpting. It wasn't just turkey calls, you know, then they did turkey calls and they added duck calls one year and the the year they added duck calls, you know, you're looking around the room and. I'm the duck call guy. Hey, you had this up. And so basically, that's how I got into it. It was just, yeah, I took that piece Location, of the contest. Locations. Yeah. You know, taxidermy, uh, paintings, decoy carving. They did it all. And basically, over the years, interest dwined on some of these things. So they kind of dropped off. And what was left was the turkey calls and the duck calls and the taxidermy. Okay. And so this year, we actually added, added art back into it. Okay. And we added four categories. And uh, yeah, I think it was a brilliant idea. And we had painters come. We had people do feather art, just all different kinds of stuff, trying to revive some of the old stuff. Oh, that's amazing. And so we took some of the turkey call judges and duck call judges and let them judge the art contest. Oh, that's amazing. To bring it back. Yeah. So what... What are so yeah? You said feather art, but like what? What are the categories for art? Um, painting, feather art, open category. You could bring anything you want. Some people did wood, wood burnings. Some people did bronzes uh, in that area or something be, like that. They, nobody did any bronzes this year, but but I can see that coming. Yeah, you well, know, it, it, they just kind of open the broadly open the door to 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 bring other craft folks in. Yeah, that's really neat. I and then, to... you know, over the years, the the duck and the turkey call grew so much. You know, what we did is we took categories. We made divisions and categories because there's multiple kinds of duck calls. There's multiple kinds of turkey calls. Um, and, you know, I can, you know, so we probably in the turkey call side have 30, 40 divisions of yeah. different type turkey calling products, yelpers or box calls or slate calls or anything. And then we have hunting categories and we have decorative categories. Yeah. So yeah, you have one of each. Yes. Yeah. So we have decorative hunting turkey, decorative hunting or or working turkey. Yeah. Decorative duck, working duck. And then amongst the decoratives we'll do like on the duck call side, I can speak to that pretty well. Yeah. Would be be laminated category, a checkered category, a match set category, a duckhead category, just all these different things that you walk around and see these guys creating, we'll we we added a category for that. Yeah. And you can enter as many categories as you want with as many calls as you want on the duck duck call side. Turkey call limits. But you know, this year this last year, I I never know how it's going to turn out participation wide but we're doing something right because th- we, we had over 500 duck calls in there last year at the turkey show yeah so that's yeah you know p- turkey guys are going why are you here so this is right. an explanation of why the duck calls are here because some dummy that you know <laughs> liked to get his head bashed in all the time <laughs> t- took it over and ran with it. so i wonder do you think i mean it makes me think that the reason we i I ask this question all the time because the working decoy carvers, there are not many. There are decorative decoys carvers, and that I assume is attributed to the ward competition. There is a competition that supports them and encourages them. Well, I'm guessing the reason that, and I always ask, I wonder why carved calls stay that way, but I guess it's the competition. I mean, you have a place that encourages them to continue to make and create and compete and rewards them for their competition. Yeah. So I'm guessing that's why they have also sustained and grown. Honestly, they're well, growing. You know, these competitions have done several things. They've pushed these call makers to become better. Yeah. And that's the big thing. And the calls that are being made and produced right now are just astronomically great. And, you know, in my eyes, 
to keep this craft and this hobby going. The more shows we have, the better. So Brian Byers heads up the CCAA show in Chicago area. And then several of us work on the Real Foot show, you know, and then several of us work at NWTF. And then, you know, Easton put on a show and we have the show here. So they're all different. They're not meant to be the same, but they're meant to to help this hobby and this craft continue in the hit you know it's it's a it's a historic thing that we don't want to end and so the guys making them are, are kind of and that's why i do it it's just to to keep our craft going yeah so with that what's your advice for people coming into collecting and how to get started and where to kind of go who to talk to that sort of thing you know find somebody that that you trust their opinion value their opinion use those guys cuz they're always willing to help you know there's there's a lot of guys out there that that will help mentor you buy what you like what i tell a lot of people is buy all the duck call books you find and read them and get to know what's available as far as historically or or contemporary because there's both books you know buy books first read them find out what you like and go chase a few of them <laughs> and see what happens yeah, see where it just, goes yeah <laughs> see where it takes you you may, you may not know where it's going to take you you may have to well, I mean, have I, an I, WTF call competition well, I, yeah I mean I, yeah I, I mean I go in circles it's <laughs> like okay I'm only going to do this well wait a minute you said you were only doing that you know this is my wife talking <laughs> why did you do that <laughs> Well, this has been great, and we've had a lot of, I've taken a lot of your time, so I don't want to let you enjoy the show. But if you were going to go to one of these shows, which one would you go to? Which, oh my gosh, I'd go to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I go to all of them. Yeah. It, you know, there's there's a lot of people willing to help. And, you know, if you want to be a call maker, these guys will help you get started. That's very different than it has been historically. It, it is. Yeah. It is. But to, today, I mean, I could name you 15 people out there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Brian Byers, look at what he does. He teaches people how to check her. Joe Buecher and his daughter uh, came and put on a painting de- demonstration. So, you know, the help's out there Yeah, you just if you want to be a maker, yeah. And if you want to be a collector, there are several of us that are, I mean, we, you know, start small. Start yeah. in your own state. That's probably the best advice I could get, yeah. you know, or, or, or buy what you like. Yeah. But, you know, if you're in Arkansas, pick up some Arkansas calls, read about them, learn about them. See if you like them. You may not. Yeah. You know, us collectors, you know, we just, we're going to do it. <laughs> yeah. It's Hoarder, just you. Hoarders, collectors, I don't know. Uh, it depends on who you're talking to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Thank you, Mark, for coming on the show. You're this welcome. has been great. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you, Mark, for coming on the show. Thanks to our producer, Chris Isaac. And thanks to you, our listeners, for supporting wetlands and waterfowl conservation. Thank you for listening to the DU Podcast, sponsored by Purina Pro Plan, the official performance dog food of Ducks Unlimited. Purina Pro Plan, always advancing. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit ducks.org slash DU Podcast. Opinions expressed by guests do not necessarily reflect those of Ducks Unlimited. Until next time, stay tuned to the Ducks. Stay tuned.